Hello, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor of our Calgary location. And uh, I have a pretty fun job at the beginning of the new year to talk about basically one of the most misquoted, misused, kind of um, oddly used passages in the Bible, and that's uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. And so last week, uh, partnering up with Chris, he did a, a passage last week. And so now I get to do part two of that exact same thing, which is pretty fun for us. And so I want you to kind of get the tone of this. This is intended to be uh, not a critique, but this is intended to be more pastoral. It's not supposed to be a rebuke, but helpful. We're trying to give you ways of seeing how the Bible works in order to understand what it really is meaning for us. And this is a really important part. So uh, we're going to kind of go from Jeremiah 29, verse 1, all the way to verse 14. So if you have your Bibles, pull those out, and it's going to be a really great time. And, uh, and, and there's a couple context pieces that I think we need to get out of the way. At this point in Jeremiah, Babylon, which is a whole other nation, has gone into Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and taken about 3,000 people back to Babylon. And now Babylon has all of these Israelites living there. And these Israelites are all confused. Why did this happen? Why is this going on? And they're having these kind of false hopes that they're going to get released pretty soon. And Jeremiah decides, I'm going to write a letter to these individuals who are in exile in Babylon, and this is where we go. And this is a pretty big, important piece, because if you're an Israelite and you are worshiping God, you are doing that around this thing called the temple. This is where God is. And now they've been taken away from the temple. But the beauty of what Jeremiah 29 says is that even though they can no longer go to him, he is going to them and they will come to him in a very different way. So Jeremiah 29 verse one says this, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests the prophets and all the people whom, notice who's the one who sends the exiles, okay? Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, Mark has already talked about in the prologue of John the importance of the word. The word is important, especially when it's coming from um, God's perspective. The word has power in and of itself. And so for Jeremiah to declare words to these individuals, especially from a God-driven directive, is important. It's, it's actually so important that it changes just about everything. When we think about the word of God, the, the logos, as John uses, it, it, it changes so much because it has power in and of itself. The Bible, the scriptures, the words that God uses to change and transform us does something incredible. In Calgary, we had a story of a, a young man who came and met with one of our members. And so he was chatting. Uh, he has a mom who is having a terminal cancer diagnosis. And as they were going through the conversation, uh, the guy who's from our church basically started reading passages of the gospel of John to this young man whose mom has terminal cancer. And he was so uplifted in that moment that he asked, okay, well, I want to have the same kind of feeling for my mom, so, so what do I do? And so uh, the member at our church said, basically, go back to your mom and read her those exact same verses. And so he went to his mom in a hospice and read those verses from John, and she was so moved by these passages that she actually went and contacted her estranged children because of how much the gospel of John had impacted her. So this young man comes back to our member and says, okay, this was incredible. Like, what do I do? I, I need more of this. And so our members suggest, hey, maybe you should go back and just read the full gospel of John to her. And so she go, he goes and, and reads her the full gospel of John and then comes back and reports. And when he comes back and he reports, he says something that was astonishing. What he says was, she was so overwhelmed and so moved. And we both came to the conclusion that because Jesus died for us, everything is different. And the actual representation of our member was basically, how, how crazy of a thought of it is this, that a non-Christian read the Bible to another non-Christian that led them both to faith. Sometimes we think that theatrics is in so much of, uh, of how eloquent someone talks or how well-versed in the scripture someone is. Or it was just the word that transformed, and that is so powerful. So when Jeremiah is speaking to them on God's behalf, he is saying something to them that is important and transformative. That's the point. And here's a little bit of a Bible lesson for us. Look at what it says. It says that this letter was written to the elders, the priests, the prophets, and all the people taken into exile. So here's a, a good Bible kind of reading tip. The Bible is not written to you, but it is for you. And that is really important. And who it is to impacts what it is for. That's the point. You get what I'm saying? 
It is not written to you, but it is written for you, which means that you have to understand what is Jeremiah and God ultimately trying to get across to these exiles in Babylon. It's so dangerous for us to make a passage about us too quickly. It is for us, but it is not to us. And that's the point. The kind of other piece of context that we need is this nation Babylon. Babylon is very first introduced to us through the Tower of Babel story. Babel, Babylon are actually the same thing. And what you find in not only Genesis, but all the way to Revelation, the first and the final, Babylon is a main character throughout. In Genesis, it's the place where everybody comes together to be like God. And in Revelation, it shows itself as an antithesis to what God is doing through his people. Babylon shows itself as the bad guy throughout the Bible, but there are some twists and turns to which this is one. Jeremiah 29, 2 says this. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. Verse 3. The letter was sent by hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hekiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And it said this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. You get how crazy this is? You remember when I told you, notice who's the one who sends? In the very first verse, it actually says that Nebuchadnezzar was the one who sent them into exile. But here in verse four, we get what impression? God says, I have sent into exile. And what we begin to see here is that Nebuchadnezzar's actions and God's actions are interconnected and woven into the same thing. There is a big piece that is needed to be known here, that in the suffering, there is growth. That's the point. And this is actually reverberated all throughout the Bible, and especially in the New Testament where it's picked up in a couple different places. Look at James chapter one. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Romans chapter 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And what we get is the same way as any athlete understands. There first has to be a breakdown before you see endurance. If you're trying to run a marathon, there's a breakdown of muscle, there's a burning of the lungs, and those things are necessary for growth and for steadfastness. That's the point. And I've realized this so often in my life, that God does something in the midst of pain that's transformative for us. Uh, in, in my engagements with my wife, the dating and engagement period was the worst possible time in my life, I, I feel like, up to this point. Like, it was so bad because what basically happened is as I'm going to date this incredible, amazing woman, a lot of backstory begins to come out. And a lot of her backstory actually related to my own idols. And what God used was he put me into a situation that I did not want to leave from to actually go and confront something that I never thought I would ever confront. And what began to happen was in the pain and in the suffering, like it was bad, like for a couple of years, a couple of years, multiple months, maybe like a full year, I would think it was weeping. It was crying. It was seeing a counselor. It was talking to pastors. It was a very difficult time. But what came out of that suffering, I would never trade for anything. God put me into a situation because of what that situation got out of me because of his goodness and his strength. This is so important. And this is why we need to notice this. Imagine the Israelites in this moment. They're taken from Jerusalem. They're exiled in Babylon. And they're probably asking themselves, God, why is this happening? God, where are you? And they're actually accusing God of something that's completely untrue. Look at verse four, once again, uh, the God of Israel to all the exiles whom I have sent. So it's not in that moment when the Israelites are suffering and they have this pain that they look at God and they say, God, you are absent. He is completely not absent. He is actually intimately involved in getting them into this because he's the one that sent them. Isn't that important? That in this case, when we think of Jeremiah 29, 11, we think of all this future hope and this amazing thing. And yes, this is all true, that God is intimately involved in the plan of getting someone out of something. But what this is also saying is that God is intimately involved in the plan of getting them into that same thing. God's involved. In the words of Francis Schaeffer, he is there and he is not silent. 
It's invisible providence. It's the fact that he is in control and he is working for a purpose. So what is the pain for? That's the point of this. And what we often see is that when God offers his love and we begin to resist it, it is often felt as wrath. And so that's what they are feeling. They're feeling pain. They're feeling suffering, but God's love is going to do something transformative in them. But this part is crucial to what they're going to experience. Look at verse five. At this moment, things really begin to turn around. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. This is mind boggling <laughs> in the scheme of scripture. There are certain things that happen in life, in movies, in films, in art. Uh, they're called motifs. When something begins to erupt and come out that you kind of know what's going to happen after something arrives. Uh, by that, I mean, uh, imagine you're watching a film and at the very beginning, it says uh, once upon a time, or you read a book and it says once upon a time. What you are expecting after that point is that this is going to be in the genre of a fairy tale. And that's what you're expecting. These motifs are really important. And so for these Israelites, when they hear the idea that we are the people of God in a place of oppression, immediately the first motif that comes to their mind is of Egypt, a people in a place of oppression. And what did God do there? Man, God showed up. There was miracles. He got a leader. Moses came and God got them out of that situation in a miraculous and powerful way. And so they have some false hope. Man, God's going to do the same thing. We're in this oppressive place. God's going to bring up a leader. He's going to make this a miraculous moment. And we are going to get out of here scot-free and we are going to go. And, and, and this is a, a common theme that they think is going to happen. And what happens? Jeremiah goes, whoa, 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 relax, chill out for a second. You think that story is going to happen. Let me tell you a twist to that motif. And instead of, look at how quickly you're going to get out. He says, this is what it means to settle in. And what does he say for them? To seek the welfare of the city, to plant, to multiply, to pray actually for your oppressors. This changes just about everything. The great famous writer Augustine makes this point in the city of God, where basically up to the point of where Jesus gives his beautiful sermon on the mount, there was this idea that a city was either really bad or, or was kind of really good. The city of man, as Augustine said, was characterized by pride. It operates on the basis of human pride and people go into a human city to make a name for themselves, to get recognition, to get a self, to find power and achievement. Then I'll know that I am somebody. That's the basis of the human city. But because that's the basis of the earthly city or the human city, it, it breeds exhaustion and oppression. People are so tired because they're working so hard to prove themselves. They go to the city needing to get, needing to get money, needing to get power, needing to get recognition, needing to get a resume, needing to get love, needing to get whatever you come to the city for, needing to get that I can feel good about myself feeling based off of their own performance. But what you begin to hear is that these cities are not just one or the other. You get to Jesus and he says in his famous sermon, you are the city on the hill. He says to his people, you are in fact the city. And what it says is that in every city, there are two cities found within that city. The city of God is not just future. It's not just geographic place. Every human city has both the earthly city and the city of God. Every city is two cities, according to Augustine. The city of God is a mini city in every city. The city of God is the people of God who form an alternate city in every city. You are a city on a hill, Jesus said to his disciples. And what does that city look like? Christians are to be an alternate city in every city in which they take in the way that they see sex, money, power. And instead of having them used the way that they're used in the earthly city of exploitation and pride, they make those things not to just feel good about themselves. It, it's not exploitative or destructive. In fact, it's used in life-giving ways, an alternate city in every city that's used to God's directions so that sex, money, pleasure, power are now used not in exploitative ways, but in life-giving ways. In every city, there is another city. And that's the first time that this bomb kind of drops in, in Jeremiah where, no, no, you're not going to get out of this. We're actually going to make you stay here for a reason. And what you are going to do is you are going to be the people that I've called you to be in the midst of suffering in this place that you do not know for a purpose. 
And you can imagine that there's this tension between them of the oppressor and themselves and their old place and their new place. And, and that kind of tension is pretty fun. Hey, when they go to Babylon, they're like, what? Who are we now? And they still probably have the old customs, the language, the way they speak, the way they act of the old place. And uh, my, my grandma's a, a pretty funny case. So she's lived in Canada for the last 20 something years. She's a citizen here. But every single day, 100%, she's never watched Canadian news. But every day she watches news from Honduras, which is the country that she's from. And even though she lives here, she is very much from there. And that's how I feel these Israelites are. Even though I'm here, I am very much there. And so living in that alternate city, in this city, changes everything. That's the point of this. Uh, the epistle to Diognetius in the second century talks about how this becomes uh, a really powerful thing for most Christians. They reside in their respective countries, but only as aliens. They take part in everything as citizens and put up with foreigners, uh, with, with everything as foreigners. Every foreign land is their home, and every home is a foreign land. They spend their days on earth, but hold citizenship in heaven. They obey the established laws, but in their private lives, they rise above the laws. They love all men, but are persecuted by all. They are reviled, and they bless. They are insulted and render honor. Doing good, they are penalized as evildoers, and those who hate them are at a loss to explain their hatred. This is a motif, starting in Jeremiah, and even for you and I today that as we live our lives, we live in a very different way, a city within a city that transforms it from the inside for God's purposes. And this idea of seeking the good, even for the enemy, should not be unusual for us who know Jesus. That idea is really important. I had a time in my life where I looked at someone and I probably would say that I hated them, I think. It was just every single time I thought about them, there'd be a physical reaction to myself. I got so frustrated, I got so angry. And I remember it just felt like a reoccurring theme where forgiveness would come up everywhere. It would come up in a sermon, it would come up in a conversation, it would come up in class. And it just became so overwhelming where I got to the point where I feel like God was saying, you have to forgive them for what they've done. And I sat there and worked it through with the Lord. And the one conclusion that came to me that I thought was the most powerful and really tipped the edge is how can I hate someone that God loves? That was my whole bit. How can I hate someone that God loves? And then I offered them that forgiveness. See, for Israel to show love to their oppressors is personified by Jesus himself. That's the point. Don't you realize that Jesus died for the oppressor and for the oppressed? He dies for the victim and the victimizer. He dies for the exiled and the exiler. He who administers grace also receives pain. The true high priest is also the perfect sacrifice. The true judge was judged in our place. He clearly has grace even for the enemies. If you fast forward actually to this exact same individual, Nebuchadnezzar, the one who takes these people from Jerusalem into Babylon, in Daniel chapter four, it talks about the transformation that happens even in his heart, the oppressor king of the other nation. It says this, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 4, 37, Praise and extol and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. I heard a story once. It was a father and their son. They were watching a Marvel movie. And as they were watching it, you know, the bad guys and the supervillains and the superheroes and the whole thing. And the little kid, probably like six or seven, says to their father, Dad, you know what's a better way of beating the bad guy? And dad goes, I don't know, son, what is it? And the little kid goes, by making them a good guy. The better way of beating the bad guy is by making them a good guy. And I feel like that's exactly what God has done. He's, he's actually gone and died for those oppressors and those exilers and those ones who do harm and has changed even them. And sometimes that hurts those of us who have felt some pain. Let's skip down to verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. Here it is, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Wow. That is on every frame in your house. You got a mug with that on it. You have that thing memorized. But here's a fundamental idea that I want you to get. The fundamental idea is this, is above all, a movement of God to man not in the first place of movement from man to God. Look who is the active participant here. 
I will visit you. I will fulfill you to promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you. God is the active participant. He is the one who moves towards us and not us towards him. And that's what's really important about this passage is because we've taken Jeremiah 29, 11, and we've made it something that isn't at all what it's really about. We actually have to take away this therapeutic captivity of the gospel where we actually have the gospel story of Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and his lordship over all things as something that makes us feel better. It is not about something that makes us feel better. The gospel is not about human potential. It is about the power of God. The gospel is not about making you feel better. It's about his glory. It's about making his name great. It's about recapturing what he declares lost. It's about defeating sin and the devil and death. It's about the adoption of his sons and daughters, and it's about his reign and his rule. So what's the future? What's the hope? What's the welfare? Is it just so I could have things that I want to not feel a certain kind of pain? No, that's not what it is. And if that's all that you think it is, then you have given up on something much greater that is given to you that you might not even imagine. Verse 12, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I'll restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I have sent you into exile. And this is so quickly where we jump. We, we skip the process of the suffering and the pain and all we want to have is the rewards, all the good stuff. When we run to that place, there's a woman, her name is Flannery O'Connor and she writes in The Reader of Today, and she writes that the reader of today is indeed looking for redemption and rightly so, but what he has forgotten is the cost of it. His sense of evil is diluted or lacking altogether and so he has forgotten the price of restoration. There is something about being restored that has a cost to it. There is something about transformation that has a cost to it. There is something that happens when we dilute the pain. We go for greater fortune, but the greater fortune only comes when there is sacrifice and turmoil and pain that God does not abandon us to, but he is intimately involved with. That's the point. This pain is seen all the time. Even though we want to run to the, the quick, easy, uh, amazing feelings of relief, there is pain that is needed. Japanese-American theologian Kosuke Koyama has observed, Jesus Christ is not a quick answer. If Jesus Christ is the answer, he is the answer in the way portrayed in crucifixion. Now, how does this make sense to this passage about fortune and goodness and welfare and hope and a future? Well, the book of Jeremiah is very closely linked to the book of Lamentations. And the book of Lamentations is basically cries about this Babylonian exile. And one of the unique functions of the book of Lamentations is that the verses are written in an acrostic fashion, which means the beginning of every verse is a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, as you go on all the way whole, all, whole way through. And it's such a confusing reason as to why would somebody write a poem in this way? Why would you write in an acrostic? Why would you use all of the Hebrew letters for the alphabet in this way in a, in a cry of lament? Well, some scholars have suggested the point that the reason why is that the author of Lamentations is trying to use the fullest extent of human language to express their cry of suffering. They're trying to express everything that they could muster up. It's, it's the community, it's all of their people and all of human language to express the pain that they are feeling. And how do you get to this welfare, this hope? And it's, it's, it's through this passage we're saying is that God is trying to eventually get those things to happen, but there has to be a process to get there first. And he knows that process. That's what's so important. Theodore Parker Ferris says it this way. It seems almost inevitable to me that Jesus should go through this kind of suffering. If you think of Jesus dis, uh, as God disguised as a man, then this will have no meaning for you. But if you think of him as a real man who in every depth of his manhood disclosed the very nature of God himself, then this suffering is inevitable. This is an intrinsic part of human existence. The uttermost depth of human misery has been plumbed by the incarnate Lord. You hear me saying? The very depth of human misery has been known by him. He gets it. He understands and when you really put this into perspective, think of Israel and Babylon. Like this is a humiliating place. 
Like they're in, they're in exile. They have been banished from their home and they have gone to a completely different place and they are humiliated. Like think of Israel under the reign of Saul and, and David and of Solomon, the heights of their, of their kingdom. And now they're, they're this, like this is humiliating. But let me inform you, nobody has felt more exiled. Nobody has felt more humiliated than Jesus Christ himself. This is important because what it gives to us is solidarity. It gives us a, a feeling of with. There's a woman, her name is Corey Ten Boom, and she writes this. Uh, she was the first female watchmaker of a family of devoutly Christian watchmakers in Harlem in the, in the Netherlands. She lost all of her family in the Nazi camps when it was discovered that they were hiding Jews. And in her memoir, The Hiding Place, she recalls how at Ravensbrück, the prisoners were required to strip every Friday for the recurrent humiliation of so-called medical inspection, where the naked prisoners standing in line were not allowed to use their hands to cover themselves, but had to stand erect with their hands by their sides. One Friday, as Corey stood behind her frail and dying sister, uh, sister Betsy, the thought came to her, he hung naked on the cross. She whispered to Betsy, standing in front of her. They took his clothes too. Betsy received comfort and strength from this. The details of degradation of Jesus do make a difference. The offense caused by Jesus Christ is not his incarnation, that indeed is a revelation, but it was his humiliation. All the pain, all the suffering, it's not that he is absent, it's that he is involved. It's not that he is left, it's that he is with. And the rewards of that suffering, the endurance, the character, the steadfastness that comes of, out of that is not, is not aloof to him. He understands what this process is. And sometimes we are so quickly to get out of a situation without understanding that he actually has a purpose for getting you into it. Think of the idea of Jesus being led into the wilderness by the spirit itself. Why? Because that's a victory over Satan, death, and the devil. That you want me to do what you want so that I can get stuff that I want. But no, 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 no. I'm actually going to push it away because this is what my father has said to me. He was intimately involved in what he provides, the future, the welfare, the hope. You may think in monetary ways or in physical ways or, or even in your own health. But God has a much bigger vision for what that is. What's welfare? What's future? What's a hope? And what you begin to realize is that the treasure and your redeemer are one in the one, same thing. Your treasure and your redeemer are one in the same thing. That the one who pushes you and gives you the strength out of a situation is also the thing that you treasure once you get out of it. So what's your true welfare? What's your true hope? What's your true actual future coming out of a place of Babylon and exile for all of this nation? The nation of Israel's future hope, welfare, welfare is Christ himself who comes on behalf of all of his people who have disobeyed, who have done the wrong thing, have said, I cannot do it anymore. And he comes and he does it for you. That is the point of this. That is the, the work of what is going on here. And this is so important for us to understand. Karl Barth, who is someone who uh, has recently just been such an impactful author into my heart, writes this. God himself and Jesus Christ, his son, at once true God and true man takes the place of condemned man. God's judgment is executed. God's law takes its course, but in such a way that what man had to suffer is suffered by this one, who as God's sons stands for all others. Such is the Lordship of Jesus Christ, who stands for us before God by taking upon himself what belongs to us. In him, God makes himself liable. At this point, at which we are accursed and guilty and lost. He it is in his son, who in the person of this crucified man bears on Golgotha all that ought to be laid on us. And in this way, he makes an end of the curse. What's the true issue for them? The true issue that God is going to ultimately reveal for these Israelites is that your greatest problem is not your exile, it's your sin. It's the curse, it's the disobedience, it's the rebelliousness, it's the defiance of the one who truly loves you. And he declares that which is lost and he goes and he redeems that very thing. Johann Hirman says it in a beautiful way. Lo, the good shepherd, for the sheep is offered. The slave hath sinned and the son hath suffered. For our atonement 
while we nothing heeded, God interceded. So what do we learn from this passage of Jeremiah 29, 11? It, it might not be to us, but it's definitely for us. Moments of suffering, moments of pain, moments where he, we feel like he is absolutely absent, moments where we feel like God is not paying attention to us. He is intimately involved. He is growing you from one measure of glory to another. He is calling you to something, not to make something of yourself, that you have great human potential, but that you know him more, that you treasure him more, that you want him more because it is in union with him that you realize that your redeemer and your treasure are one. That's the point. So who is the hope? Who is the plan? Who is the future? And who is the welfare? Christ and Christ alone. He was and is the fulfillment of all of their hopes and all of ours. Father, we just, uh, we thank you for being here to hear this passage, to read what it is that it's saying to us. And I pray that you would use this in such a powerful way for us to understand that the hope, the welfare is more than just physical. It's more than just financial. It's more than just relational. But God, that ultimately the things that you have won for us, the victory that you have gotten for us is much more than just the perspective that we have that is so close. That you have done something so grand that you have actually made the son sin itself, that he who knew no sin became sin, that he took our punishment, that he took our pain. And in fact, you have given us his righteousness, that this beautiful exchange is one that as we sit at Jeremiah 29, 11, and we see all that comes after it, that we sit in awe of who you are, that we are overwhelmed by your love and your goodness. And I pray that we, as we just, we sit on that, that you would do much to make a name for yourself in our hearts and in our minds. We thank you for all of this in Jesus' name, amen.